Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're pleased to welcome Stephanie Shriak this evening in conversation with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. The chat is closed, which you may have heard as you joined us, but you can keep the chat window open as I will be sharing links to purchase Run to Win from Literati. And of course, uh, if you are watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books right below me in the description. And if you're watching live, of course, you can submit questions using the Q&A that's available to you, uh, the features on your toolbar or at the bottom of your screen at any time. We're also giving a test run of uh, Zoom's live transcription service. So if you do need closed captioning uh, on your toolbar, you might find the live transcription button and you can turn that on to have live transcription. Um, but again, please feel free to submit questions at any time and I will read a uh, selection of those questions at the conclusion of, of Debbie and Stephanie's conversation. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to you anywhere uh, at your home in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we do also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. And again, if you're watching us on YouTube, that link is in the description. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Raised in the copper mining town of Butte, Montana, Stephanie Shriak has been working to get Democrats elected for 25 years. Since Shriak became president of Emily's List in 2010, she has overseen a decade of phenomenal growth in the organization, raising hundreds of millions of dollars, helping elect record numbers of women to the House and Senate, and recruiting and training hundreds more. Emily's List now is now nearly 5 million members strong. And joining her in conversation, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell represents the 12th District of Michigan in the U.S. House of Representatives. Before being elected to Congress, Debbie was the chair of Wayne State University's Board of Governors, an active civic and community leader. She's recognized a recognized national advocate for women and children. They can't hear you, but they can sense you through the powers of the internet. So please join me and welcoming Stephanie Shriak and Congresswoman Debbie Dingell into your living rooms. Well, thank you, uh, John. It's great to see you. And Stephanie, welcome to Ann Arbor. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, great job, John. And thank you, Lerardi, for uh, doing this. It, these independent bookstores around this country are so important. And so I just wanna reiterate any support for our independent bookstores, particularly our Ann Arbor one, please um, join us in investing in that. We, we need all the help we can get to keep these bookstores going because they are jewels, just jewels. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am to welcome you and to have people meet somebody who's been a friend for a long time and somebody who I've worked with in the trenches mm -hmm. and I want them to get to know you. But let me start off with an easy question. What made you want to write a book? <laughs> well, you know me well enough that I've always stayed in the trenches. So I really didn't think I was going to be writing a book. Uh, and then honestly, what happened and, and Debbie, you and, I, you and I went through this together after the devastating loss of the presidential in 2016, we saw at Emily's List thousands of women come to us wanting to run for office, just to find their voice, save their communities, fight for their country. And now that number actually is over 62,000. 62,000 women have come. But as it was happening, my co-author, Christina Reynolds, who is our vice president of communications and I, were realizing that what we were seeing was not just a moment in time, but the beginning of a true sea change. Because the differences of women that were stepping up in race, age, geography, profession, you know, women who were nurses and teachers and small business women, doctors, 
a former CIA agent, which I didn't even know you could run for Congress after being a CIA agent, but guess what, you can. Uh, all these incredible stories were coming and we wanted to share these stories because we thought they would be inspiring to others. And so that's where the sort of the nugget of the book started. And then as we started writing it, we realized that we had these 60,000 women who needed some basic concepts of how to run. It's not easy to do, but it's also not rocket science. And we thought we could put some lessons together that would help those women and then ultimately help all women as they move through and try to make change in the world. You know, in the book, you talk about how hard it is to be a first, but how, if there's never been anyone like you in your room, in the room, it's a sure sign that they need someone like you. You've been at Emily's List to see many first. Tell us, and you just were telling me you wanted to tell the story. Tell us some of, about some of those firsts and what those firsts mean to you. Oh, it's, and I have been so blessed to see so many. Which part of me is also like, it's been the last 10 years. I started in 2010 and we're still seeing all these firsts. So I just want to say, we're behind. We got to speed this up. We need to get through the first so we can get to the fifth, sixth, and sevenths. But I will say some that just truly, truly um, have moved me that I will never, ever forget. Uh, one was definitely in, there were actually a couple in the 2018 election that ended up in the class of uh, 2019, uh, that historic making class where we were able to deliver the majority. It was amazing. And you were so helpful in that uh, Congresswoman as we did this work. I grew up in Montana and I grew up knowing that there were Indian reservations and not understanding what that meant as a child, because you were just totally separated. And I never, I never ever truly got it. I was like, this is really bad. Why are we doing this? And there's just, I just always struggled and wanted to be more and more helpful to our sisters in the Native American community. And, and finally in 2018, we were able to endorse and very actively support two extraordinary Native American women, Sharice Davids, your colleagues, uh, Sharice Davids and Deb Holland, who won and became members, the first two Native American women ever, ever elected to Congress. And it happened in 2018, which is ex extraordinary. And now many of you, as many of you may know, Deb Holland is the first Native American to be in the cabinet under Joe Biden, which is also super cool and amazing and gives me just goosebumps to think what that's going to mean. But I think those two women, and I think what it means as I go back out West and I particularly out West and run into friends who belong to various tribes out um, in the, on the Western side of the country, they, know these two women, they know their stories, they, they now can be something that they see which they've never thought was possible. And that's, the diff that's what you get. It's the same thing when Catherine Cortez Masto became the first Latina United States Senator uh, in Nevada and Michelle Lujan Grisham, who was also one of your colleagues and then ran for governor became the first Latina to be elected governor ever in the country in New Mexico. Everyone I run into knows those two women and their st entire stories. It makes it possible to dream for entire communities of, of women who felt left behind. You know, they're incredible women too. They're really all friends and when Deb got Oh. nominated to be Secretary of Interior. I just, anyway, you've made a difference. You've made a difference to so many people. Um, let me ask you this. What was the most surprising or challenging part of writing the book? Well, I'd never done anything like this before, right? I'm so, and I'm not a writer. I, this is not something I do. So thankfully, Thankfully, I had Christina Reynolds, who is the co-author of this book, who did a bulk of the writing where I was doing more of the storytelling and putting the pieces together. So we've, we've made a great partner. Otherwise, I'm not sure I could have pulled something off like this. Uh, so 
as we talk about in the book, it really helps to have friends and support networks to get this done. And that was very much the case with this book. And we were able to also work with the other staff in the organization at Emily's List to pull out some of the other lessons and how we talk about engaging you know, from how do you ask for money to what are the tips to help grow a thicker skin if you haven't ever done this before to just deciding to run. And they all had stories, which was so, so fantastic. We just had to put it together, which then became the hard part, by the way. The hardest part uh, ultimately was like putting in too many stories. I, mean, I remember we read it, I was like, I think we've put like 12 stories about Lauren Underwood in. I think we should probably cut that down a little bit. Who's a Congresswoman, youngest African-American uh, Congresswoman in the history of our country from Illinois, uh, you know, or talking about, we talked about Michigan so much because it was Governor Whitmer and Jocelyn Benson, of course, and Haley, <laughs> Congresswoman Haley Stig, Melissa Slutkin. We just kind of kept talking about the Michigan miracle. And I was like, I think we've talked about this story four times because it's so awesome. <laughs> so that was always a very challenging and interesting part of writing, to be honest, because we would have to go back and go, we got to get back to the bones of this, the how and the lessons that people can take away. So it was interesting. So when you say it that way, what are some of the questions women need to ask before they run or for some take that big leap? No, I think this is really important. <coughs> we're gonna start this process and start the book about, you know, from this aspect because so often what happens and when we've had, you know, we've trained thousands and thousands of women over the years and recruited <laughs> women and often the first rounds of questions we get are things like, how do you put together the money? And how do you put together the staff? And I don't really understand how this works and how do you file? And we always are like, stop. Those, those we can teach, those are easy. Those are not the right question. The real question is like deep down in your belly, what set of values are going to drive you to serve the public? Is, what is, is there a set of issues, values, or desire to make change? And what is that? Because if you don't have sort of that center core passion for your community, and you are a great example of this, right? Someone who's just like deeply committed every day, how do I make the lives of my, my, my district, my state, my country better? You got to make sure you've got that. And if you've got that, then you also have to ask, do I have the energy and ability to do this work? Because though it is not going to Mars, as I like to say, because I think that seems hard and I love that mass is on its way, but it's still really challenging. And I'm sure you have so many stories of how challenging it can be. It's exhausting. The hours are not pleasant. You are in the public eye all the time. So is your family most of the time. And so you really have to think that through. All that being said, I still want everybody to think it through because it's so important to serve the public and have those voices there. Because if it's not, if your voice isn't there, somebody else's will be. And you wanna make sure that the issues that you are most concerned about that relate to your community are being heard. That's very well said. You know, women have made a lot of progress over the last few years. You talked about the class of 218, which was incredible. And we even saw more Republican women elected in 2020. I know what my answer to this is, but other people have said this to me, is the job done now? Is the play, is the play playing field level or do we still have a lot more work to do? Oh, I know, and I wish, I wish the answer was yes, don't we? I mean, it is, it is 2021, <laughs> right? Like why, why are we still here? And yet we are here. And honestly, with the rise of what I consider an authoritarian movement inside of aspects of the Republican Party, not the entire, but aspects of the Republican Party, we now are at a very dangerous point in which 
we have to be very mindful of how women and particularly women of color are viewed in this country. This is not just an elected office, but across the board. We have seen such an increase of very negative attacks driven through social media by typically, but not always, but typically the far right that is very, very damaging toward women. And yes, the men, the male, your male colleagues are getting some attacks. I get that, but those attacks tend to be around the policies or positions those men are taking. What is happening with the women, they are getting undercut in a very dangerous way about character and what their role as women are in society. And that is a dangerous place to be. And we're seeing an expand. And Emily's List is taking this uh, a lot more, um, a lot more actively because we know that once you undercut the vision of that woman elected official who's supposed to be still today perfect and is supposed to be the motherly or the sisterly or the whatever kind of pedestal you have put her on. Once you undercut that, it is harder for her to get up than the men who make mistakes as well. We all make mistakes, hey, we all make mistakes. The men make mistakes and they get the boys will be boys. The girls make mistakes and they're done with, off with their heads. I mean, so this is part of our problem and this is what we have to push through. I think we push through it by just pushing through it with volume of women, particularly diverse women, uh, where they just start getting used to it. And there will always be that, that faction, but it's not the just not even close to the majority of the country. That's what we have to remember, that they're powerful and we have to fight through this moment. We have to fight through it hard. That's wise words, my friend. You've been at Emily's List for 11 years. How has running for office for women changed over the years? And maybe I'll tie it back to the last question too. Are things better? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, so Emily's List, as you know, has been, Emily's List has been around 35 years, 36 years. And I can definitely say in those 36 years, talking often with our founder, Ellen Malcolm, that things have changed dramatically. I mean, when, when Emily's List started, the Democratic Party wasn't so keen on running women for office. And now we work hand in hand with the Democratic Party to do recruitment and definitely at the national level and, and in most space or most states. So that's a good positive change. But even in my tenure in these 11 years, I have noticed a couple of really positive changes. Um, one is just the pure volume of women who want to run. I mean, we even, even in, so I, can't, I started in 2010. And really in the first five years, we still at Emily's List were spending much more time recruiting women, trying to convince women to run for office, to step up and run for higher office. Uh, and not that we don't still do that, we do it. Because there are places in the country that need to recruit. But now we have so many more coming at us in, in a really good way. You're like, okay, I want to run. Now what do I do? And that's a huge change. And I think that's a sea change. It's not going away. It hasn't slowed down. Women are still coming to us every day saying they want to run. They're looking at local offices. You know, they're not all thinking they're going to run for U.S. Senate. Uh, but they're, they're starting. So that's a big difference. Another difference I've noticed, I think it's interesting. When I first started, it was still really hard to get a candidate who had lost to reconsider again. And the truth is, is that a lot of, a lot, both women and men lose their first races and have to come back and run a second time because you just, you learn, you, you get better. It's hard. These, you know, you just, you don't know all the things. Now you have a network, you're a better public speaker, you can debate. And we would have a terrible time getting women to reconsider running for office after a lot. That's really changed after 16. And I noticed 
even in 16 and then in, in 2018, those women who lost were like, oh no, I'm running again. Like I didn't even have to ask them. <laughs> they were like, oh, what? Of course I'm running again. And there was just no slowing them down. And that to me is why this is not a moment, that this is a cultural change that is happening, that we are part of, and it can really make a huge impact. I wish some of the other things would get better. You know, the fundraising, particularly for women of color is still an obstacle. Uh, it is still harder for black and brown women to raise money than it is for white women. Uh, and it's something that Emily's List is very, very focused on moving forward. We've tried to make some corrections in the last couple election cycles. We have to do more. We all have to do more uh, to, to correct this structural racism that's even inside of our party. Uh, so there's things that need to be done, but the energy's there and it's different. It's, a, it's exciting, although I still, Stephanie knows this. I hate fundraising. I hate the fundraising more than I hate anything. <laughs> and it's hard. You know, you got to, and women don't like to ask for money. I think, I mean, I do think that's one of the problems. I think men don't hesitate as much as we do. But let me ask you another question. It kind of ties again to these last two uh, questions and things you've been saying. Too often, women think that they have to be perfect to run for office. And by the way, it's not just to run for office, to ask for the promotion, apply for a job. You know, we tend to set ourselves higher standards. Um, what do you recommend for women to help find their confidence? You know, they don't have to be perfect, not afraid to ask for the raise, not afraid to be out there and get in the fight. This is really, really important. I think part of it is we need we need our sisters and, and, and good brothers around us to help us with this too, because we we can be our worst enemies on this. And we've, we've seen so much academic research that has shown that women will not go after the job if they do not have 100% of the, of the job description, whereas the men are like, Ah, I can do one of those things close enough. You know, they just, there's just this sort of sense of uh, empowerment that women are still trying to find. And, I, and I'm embarrassed to say, but the truth is I did the same thing. When I was asked to put my hat into the ring for this job as president of Emily's List 11 years ago, I said no, because I looked at the job description. I knew it was following our founder, which would be no easy task for anybody. Oh. I mean, she's she is just a stateswoman and an amazing, amazing woman, period. But I, at the core, I knew I could fundraise. I'm a fundraiser by trade, so I don't mind fundraising as much as others do. And I have been a campaign manager and a strategist, but I had never done communications. And this was you know, a role in which you needed to be the top spokesperson and you were gonna have to go do TV. And I'd never done TV before. I always sent people to go do TV. <laughs> like, here you go. And so I was like, I can't do this job. And it took me a while and some really good friends who said, are you nuts? Like, of course you can, you just, you, try, you learn how to do it. And that's the thing. No one knows how to do all of any job, period. I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care what job you're going for. No woman nor no man can knows every aspect of a job until you get in it. And then you still learn every day. I'm sure, Congresswoman, you would say you learn every day. I, I do so much. As the president of Emily says, I am a different leader different strategists. I'm a different person than I was 11 years ago. And I'd like to think I'm a better person because of all I have learned along the way. On the job training is the key. <laughs> this is what we need to be doing. And trust me, I, you've got some colleagues. There are some people in the house that don't know so much. And most of the women just by the experiences of life are better suited to be up there because they're willing to listen and learn. And those Two things. If you're willing to listen and learn. You know, John used to say, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. And we do need to 
listen more. Uh, but I, I learn every day, like you do. And if we stop learning, then we stop living. So I agree with you on that. I'm gonna ask you a question that's a bugaboo of mine. So it's not even, which is women supporting women mm -hmm. and the importance of it. And my generation, which is, I'm young, I'm, ex I'm seasoned, but I'm not. A lot of times women didn't support each other. They felt if one succeeded, they didn't. Why is it important? And I think you've probably learned a lot about this in the 11 years that you've been at Emily's List, the importance of women supporting each other, that when one woman does well, we all lift ourselves up. That's right, and this is the generational change that's going on. And I, and I get it, I, I say this, um, with, with great respect for those who came before me, who had to be the first, who had to break down the doors so I could walk through them. Like I, I am of a generation that I didn't have to break down a door. I didn't, you know, I, I'm a middle class white woman who was able to walk through the door. I mean, that's the honest to God truth. Now that would have been different for a African-American of the same age. So I understand there's a racial component to this as well. And I understand where my privilege is on this question, but, but the women who came first really did have to be sort of extraordinary and perfect, which is so unfair. And of course, by the time you get there, you are so hardened because it was so difficult to get there. And then folks like us, like come prancing through going, here we are. Uh, and there's just a little bit of like, whoa, wait a second, what's happening? But the good news is that now there's volume coming in because now I feel like our generation, you have been a leader on this and, and it keeps getting better as I get younger, is that we got to grab each other you know, arm in arm and go in. Cause guess what? That's what the guys do. That is what the guys do. How do you think they are still there? They look out for each other. They watch each other in the back. They go play basketball together. They go golf together. They do all this. Stuff. We don't like have to play their games. We can do what we can do it the way we want to do it, but we've got to look out for each other because they are, and if we don't, nobody will. You know, there are not, there are some good men, but seriously, women, we got to back each other up. You know, that's one of my biggest messages in life. What's the best piece of advice you've been given in your years of campaigning, or the one thing that you wish you had learned sooner? Well, the one, uh, the one bit of advice I got fairly early. And again, this is, I was able to, to take it, which, uh, which has been helpful is that just, just say yes to the opportunity, even if it doesn't feel like it's quite the next step or the next, don't get stuck on, oh, I have this perfect plan that that's going to lead me to whatever I think I'm going to get led to. I packed up the car many times and drove all over this country to be an entry level finance staffer, to, to manage a campaign that I barely knew what I was doing uh, and messed up a million things and thankfully he won. Anyway, uh, but I, I said yes. And when I was in the office, I said yes to like, no job is too small nor too big to try. And I think that's the other mindset particularly is just know that everything has to get done and just be, if you're willing to just do whatever you will, people will notice and they will see those who will roll up their sleeves and do the small stuff and will take the risk to do the big stuff. Even if they fail, they'll, they'll be noticed that they took the risk. So that, that's one thing I learned. I learned pretty early and I'm grateful I did. And it's really served me well doesn't mean it has always gone well, but it has served me well. <laughs> There's been a few along the way. Uh, so there, there is that. Um, something I would have learned, like to have learned earlier, uh, sort of gets back to my initial hesitancy about taking the big step. You know, I'd said yes to all these job opportunities, but yet was afraid to take this big one with Emily's list. And 
I wish somebody would have sat down and and really got into my head that you don't need to do everything to do the job. You really, like you really don't. I worry sometimes that women, this happens particularly in families, but I think it happens in a lot of fields of work. That women feel like they need to go to a lot of trainings and do a lot of studying and get this right before they jump in. I worry that we get ourselves on what I call the training hamster wheel and that they never like take the jump off the hamster wheel and like run for office or take the job or try it. Uh, that there's this, this, there's kind of a safety in that I'm gonna practice more and I'm gonna practice more, I'm gonna train more. And I really wanna get women out of that mindset. A little training, that's a good thing. Too much training is too much training because on the job training is the best that you're gonna get anyway. And so I really do worry about that. And um, I just always like to say, a little bit good, lot too much. There can be too much. So let one of my favorite lessons in the book is that loss is a part of the journey. How did you learn that lesson? Oh my goodness. Well, my losses started in high school because I kept running for class president and I got shellacked year after year after year. <laughs> Which may be why I've decided I am a better campaign strategist than I am candidate. Uh, I did win my, st my student body election though. When I became student body president, thank you, thank you. The only reason I won that, see this is it, this is how I knew what my strength was. I realized that the electorate was different. And it was no longer just my class, but it was the whole school. So I just focused on the freshmen and sophomores and forgot about the juniors. <laughs> Targeting. I got it. I figured it out. I figured it out. I'm like mm, expanded electorate was good for me in that situation, and I used it. Uh, so that I so I learned that early. I also was an athlete, and I really for those um, who have the ability and access to compete as an athlete, and I think that's where Title IX has really had a generational shift for women. You know, you lose a basketball game, you got to play another one in a week, or I, I was a swimmer too. You, you know, you have a bad meet, you have a bad race, you got to have another one in an hour. And so you just got used to like, okay, I screwed that one up. How am I going to make the next one better? And I think that one was that's been very, very good. I also lost my first campaign, um, my first job, which I always, um, I remember Mary Reader, she was running for Congress. God bless her. She's no longer with her anymore, with us anymore. Wonderful, wonderful woman from Minnesota. And I remember coming in the day after the election, just devastated. I was the finance director. This is this was my first paid job I'd ever had. And I was just, and I, I had my hair up and like, I don't I probably had the same clothes on them the night before. I had my glasses on, I didn't have my contacts on, I didn't have makeup on. And I walked in, I'll never forget this ever, ever. Mary had her contacts in and she was dressed for the day after losing, like hours before, because it was a late call night and we knew we had to start making phone calls because it's what happens, win or lose, you got to make a lot of phone calls. And she looked at me and she said, we may have lost, but we're still going to hold it together. So she basically was like, get this fixed, like put your contacts in. And I was like, okay, you're right. You're right. Put your, put your big girl pants on and get through it. We're going to be okay. And she was right. And we were, we were okay. I learned a lot. So another one of your chapters in the book is about celebrating liberally. Why is that important? And what are some of the things you've been celebrating in this past year, over the last year? That's great. Thank you for bringing that up because I think, um, I mean, granted, everyone knows I'm a Democrat. I have Republican friends. I hang out with Republicans, but I don't exactly know like, how they react to things. But I feel like Democrats have a little bit of an Eeyore complex in my experience. <laughs> Where we do, we're like, we, and maybe it's because we're so hungry to like keep doing things, and so we win, and then we're like, okay, keep going. We got to do some other bunch of stuff, and we take not even a breath of celebration, and recognize that celebration also is action. 
like in my mind, uh, passing that unbelievable American rescue plan of 1.9 trillion to totally save this country, that is about the best way to celebrate liberally that you possibly could. I am so, so pleased about that package and what is, it's already helped my family, my working family in the Midwest. So I think it's so important uh, to do it because also it's more fun. <laughs> like it's just, at some point you gotta have some fun in this. Like you gotta come with joy when you can and have some fun and do this. And for Emily's list, we, we, we won races in November and we lost races and we lost some really great candidates, which, which was very de devastating. But that being said, we still got to see the first woman ever become the vice president of the United States of America. And we will not know for years to come what that is going to mean for little girls, particularly black and brown little girls in this country. But I can tell you in our experience, when we see statewide elections of women for the first time, we almost always see an increase of women running for office for years to come. And this just happened nationally. This is huge. And every time I just even thinking about it, I, I, I get goosebumps. I just think Vice President Harris is, was a phenomenal choice, a great partner for President Biden and um, a game changer for women. I really do. You know, I was reading to a class this past week uh, for, for uh, March's reading month and it was boys and girls. Mm -hmm. uh, probably about 30 of them, it was a Zoom. And we somehow started talking about, uh, I'd read them a book about Grace Runs for President. Oh. And none of the boys wanted to run for president. And eight of them told me they were gonna be president of the United States, all the great. And I didn't even ask the question. One of them raised their hand and said, I'm gonna be president someday. And then they all chimed in. So that really struck me. And that one of the boys did. So, wow. and they were third graders. So. That's, a good, that's a good sign. You know, there's been some really interesting academic research out of that American University. That was that. This was like, now. This was years ago. Now, I'm um, pre uh, Clinton campaign for president, where girls and boys of that age would equally want to be president or run for president. But by the time they were in high school, there was already a divide and women had lost interest by a significant amount and it just kept getting worse. So the culture is hard on our girls. It's hard on our boys too in different ways too. So I don't wanna like dismiss that culture is hard, but it's knocking out some of that gumption that they have as kids. Like I, I talk about in the book a story about <laughs> this little Daisy Girl Scout who, who totally upsold me on cookies at the dry cleaner a couple of years ago. And I'm like, this girl, she's gonna run. She's gonna run for office. She was amazing. She was like, oh, it was a Daisy. She's like six years old. And it was awesome to see like no, no fear. No fear. I think about the women who are scared to raise money. And then I think about that little six-year-old who's like, uh, she totally snuck an extra buck from me because she's upsold me on the s'mores cookies, by the way, which are more expensive, just in case you were wondering. They're very all good. very good. They're very good. Yeah, well, no. I've, I've, I've seen the same ones do the same thing to me. <laughs> They're sneaky. I love it. I know, but good. John, I think I'm supposed to, it's um, uh, that 7.45. Do we have questions from the audience watching? We don't have questions just yet. I have a, people of course can submit their questions using the Q and A feature if they'd like to, and I will ask some of them. I have a question though, that I could ask, and then I'd be happy to give it uh, the floor back to you, Debbie, to, to, to ask any- I have more. Questions. Okay, great. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much to both of you for joining us tonight and, and for taking part in this conversation. Um, one of the things that I'm curious to know, Stephanie, um, is all this wonderful, advice that you've talked about for for women who want to get into office and and sort of getting through these kind of you know societal blocks or 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 psychological um stumbling blocks as well in the process but the thing i'm curious about is is for young people running for office i think a lot of people see 
uh, getting into a higher office, whether it's even if it's like local offices, but especially like a, a congressional run or something like that, as necessarily needing to compromise their politics or their sort of moral beliefs or, or sort of we've had this received wisdom of politics as this kind of compromise that when you are young and you're idealistic, or especially if you're a Democrat and you have progressive values, you might need to sort of rein them in to be more responsive to the electorate, to win an election, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I worry that there's also a gendered component to that perhaps as well, um, but that that can sort of turn um, pers prospective candidates off to the process of politics, is seeing it as a sort of this sort of machine process. Um, and maybe this is a question that can involve Debbie as well as, 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 a, as a woman uh, in elected office, um, but how can people who are interested in um, taking this jump reconcile what to expect in that sense with their, their beliefs um, and, and, and trust that they'll be able to follow the principles that are exciting them about taking that jump in the first place, if that, if that makes sense. It does, it does. And I love the, the Congresswoman's thoughts on this too. I mean, what, you know, what is really important is just to know what, what you believe and what you care about. And I think that's sort of your touchstone. Uh, but you also wanna get things done, you know, and you can't get anything done unless you get elected. And you've got to, you know, we talk about this a lot and we're very honest with people about it, you know, when we're looking at, what kind of job you're looking for, what kind of position, where you're, um, you know, are you thinking about city council? Are you thinking about school board? Are you thinking county commissioner? Where do you live? Are there a lot of Republicans there? Are there Democrats? What kind of, I mean, we, do, we have to do, there's a little bit of science to this uh, and figuring out how to win a campaign does not mean giving up what you care about. It is how do you, how do you relate to the folks in the in that district in a way that they feel you are hearing them. And I know there's a sense by some that think that's compromise, but I would argue that it is actually learning and finding the common ground that you can bring everybody together in your values and theirs. And that, I mean, you and Debbie Dingle, you have one of the best people in the entire country that does just that. Uh, it is not easy to do, but that's what you've got to do. Like politics, I know folks get the sense like it's this like dirty thing. It's all about people. It's about people who have to come together to find solutions that are going to better people's lives in the best way that they can. You know, I want to, Congress means coming together. And a compromise is not a dirty word. Uh, I, I, I think that you've got, I've spent this week uh, bringing people together between the labor community who are scared to death that they're going to lose their jobs with some of the environmental ideas that we need to undertake for the impact of global climate changes on, on our environment. But you get in a room and you each tell each other the truth and you find that common ground so you can find the policies that accomplish both. They protect American jobs. They, I mean, let's, the auto industry is a good example that there'll be fewer jobs when we don't have the internal combustion engine, but we need to build batteries here in the United States of America. So federal dollars need to be used to protect American jobs here and you bring people together. And I, I, I do, um, I, Stephanie knows, I try to bring people with a lot of strong feelings and a lot of different perspectives together. Um, I have, you know, I've got different life experiences and I've had some of that, but that's not compromising on your values or your morals. It's moving the ball forward. I mean, I, on the other hand, I am somebody who feels very strongly that every American's got a right to healthcare, period. And so right now people are asking me would I support certain things that I think are baby steps. Uh, and I'm not willing to agree to baby steps right now because I think this is a time to go big coming out of COVID when people have seen the fractures in our healthcare system. But you talk to people and I find one of the most important things you do is to include everybody. We all have, Stephanie talked about learning earlier. 
I, I've had different life experiences than someone else has. And part of doing the job is to bring all those different life perspectives, all those different knowledges to the table and coming up with the right solution. Thank you both for, for your perspective. Um, Debbie, uh, you have the floor. Uh, I think we have time for ask Stephanie, two more got, questions. Yeah, we've got, I'm gonna ask her uh, two questions right now. Uh, the, and then I'll ask her the last one. But um, given the challenges this country faces right now, give us some examples of women leadership that inspires you. Well, honestly, I mean, I, every day I, I feel like Speaker Pelosi just continues to surprise and amaze me. And I, I say this, and I've said this to her over the years, I, 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 it took me a while to come around to her, to be honest, because I grew up, I'm like a Montanan, and she's from California, and I'm just like, ah, I'm not sure about all of this. She's brilliant, and she shows what I call sort of a, a feminine leadership that's very different. And I think that's what's really important right now is that there isn't one type of leader in, in, among women. And I think for so long, the country saw one and her name was Hillary Clinton. And then everybody's measured against Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton's a fabulous female leader. But we're not all Hillary Clinton. We all lead differently. We all come with our own perspectives. We all come with our own, our own ways about us. Uh, I remember one, two, one day, somebody told me that I would never be really successful because though I was respected, I wasn't feared enough. And I said, you know, I'm not gonna be feared. I'm gonna work my rear end off to bring everybody together and like you, um, bring people to the table. I don't need to scare people to do that. I'm going to find another way to do it because I don't want to. I don't want to be that person. And I, so I think, like I think of her, and I see that all the time. Also, like the quiet, the quiet ones, like the. Um, yeah, I worked in the Senate for a while with Senator. I was Senator John Tester, Chief of Staff from Montana, and I'll never, ever, ever forget Senator Patty Murray in her like what is she five foot nothing um walking in and john you all don't know is like big farmer guy like flat top missing fingers like amazing and she came in and she's like you're gonna on this and you're gonna get this done and i need to know you can you're gonna and he's like i'm with you and she's like i need to hear it again and he goes yes ma'am i'm with you and i was like oh she just got him to call her ma'am i you know, you would never think that that would happen. And it did. And it was pretty awesome. And I'm like, yep, that's it. So that's like, just, there's so many ways to be a leader. And it's finding your own path. That's so good about this moment because people need to see different kinds of women's leadership. It's not just one. It's different, you know, you see Stacey Abrams and what she's seeing doing in Georgia and how she's like not only rolling up her sleeves and registered voters, but has now become her own stateswoman, someone who you could visualize as governor, should be governor, by the way. Um, like you're just seeing these new leaders come up and they just have different ways of doing it. And that's what we need. Last question of the night. What do you say to women listening who might be thinking about running tonight? Well, first off, I want everybody who's listening to think about running for office, period, because you never know when you're going to be called. I will not take a no. I will take a not now. But you should never say no because you don't know when your community needs you. So even if your life isn't quite in the space to do it today, and also you got to remember there's city council, school boards, park boards, judgeships, clerkship. I mean, oh my gosh, there's so many. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of elected officials in this country. It's not just Congress and the presidency. There's all these local jobs. So if you're even pondering, even a little tiny bit, go to the emilyslist.org website uh, and sign up for the Run to Win program that we have there because it will just start walking you through the process of just how to think about it. Super easy. Um, you can also buy Run to Win. Uh, the book does that, does that as well. Um, and then there's a really great, for those who've decided to run, but 
but haven't quite figured out maybe for what yet, there's a training center on that website that is very good. The staff did a phenomenal job of just like, here's the basics from like, how do you say yes? How do you file for office? How do you talk to voters? How do you raise money? How do you do a press release? I'm telling you, there are templates you can download. Just make it easy for yourself. Go. You don't have to start. Again, this isn't rocket science. We're not going to Mars. It's hard, but you can build the pieces. They're not complicated. If you don't know, learn how, if you don't know how to do something, you'll learn it. And that's the thing. And it's, you'll meet the most amazing people, by the way the most amazing people in this process. Well, we've Stephanie, reached, thank you. Yeah, we've reached the and top of the hour. Thank you so much. That we want you to come to Ann Arbor in person when COVID gets better. I do. I want to, too. I will be there. I will be there. Um, and uh, we, we hope to have you in the store uh, soon um, when it's safe to do though. But uh, in, until then, we hope you continue to both stay safe and, and be well. Um, of course, the, the links that, that Stephanie mentioned are in the description uh, below for if you're interested. And of course, you can also buy the book uh, below if you're watching us later on, on YouTube through links in the description. Stephanie Shriak, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, thank you so much for joining us. And to all of our viewers, thank you for joining us as well. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. So have a great night. Take care, Thank all. You. Thank you both. Thank you, John. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Bye, all.